Thank you, Nick. It's a uh, pleasure to be here, and I'm uh, delighted and honored to be here with my colleague from the other side of the building, Representative Scott, and um, to have a chance to participate in today's conversation. It's been uh, about a half a century now that the Vera Institute has been a constant voice of reason and fact in our national conversation on the meaning of justice. And the leadership conference continues to play a vital role in so many of the important debates in Congress today. Together, your work has challenged long-held notions about crime and punishment in this country, leading to reforms that improve the fairness of the criminal justice system, save taxpayer dollars, and strengthen communities. These contributions have been a valuable resource to those of us in government working to, as we heard the Attorney General describe, get smart on crime. Although I realize that smart might not be the first word that jumps to mind when someone mentions Congress, there are encouraging signs that perhaps the worst of the Washington standoffs may at last be behind us. Last month, we were able to pass an omnibus spending bill that will keep the government open for this fiscal year. Now that we've managed to perform that most basic responsibility, we can <laughs> focus on perhaps some of the other long-term challenges we face. And few of those challenges are as important or as difficult as the unsustainable growth in our federal prison spending. You've all heard the statistics. We now have well over 200,000 inmates in the custody of the Federal Bureau of Prisons, each costing $29,000 per year on average. When you factor in the cost of the Marshal Service, we will spend $8 billion this year keeping federal prisoners locked up, a 20-fold increase since 1980. To put these numbers in context, spending on incarceration is now more than 30 percent of the Justice Department's budget. We spend more on federal prisons than we do on the DEA, the ATF, and all federal prosecutors put together. And since 2000, the amount we spend keeping federal prisoners locked up has doubled, while federal funding for state and local law enforcement has been cut in half. So the crowd out effect on other public safety programs is very real. This unsustainable growth in prison spending has made one thing clear. We cannot incarcerate our way to keeping the public safe. Money that is spent locking up a low-level offender for longer than necessary is money that cannot be spent on FBI agents, prosecutors, crime victims, or local police departments. State leaders, including in my own state of Rhode Island, and a Big shout out to our corrections director, uh, my friend A.T. Wall. I uh, have had to deal with this reality years ago. We were faced with a choice, either keep spending money building additional prisons at the expense of virtually every other law enforcement priority, or figure out a way to control corrections costs without jeopardizing public safety, with organizations like the Vera Institute providing extremely valuable support, Rhode Island and other states took the latter path and pursued data-driven corrections reform. We examined sentencing policies, beefed up reentry assistance to reduce recidivism, and offered alternatives to incarceration for some offenders. To address the unique needs of certain populations in the criminal justice system, many states expanded drug abuse recovery programs and created specialized courts, such as Rhode Island's innovative Veterans Treatment Court. Some states, including Rhode Island, offered inmates the opportunity to earn earlier release from prison in exchange for completing courses proven to reduce the risk that they would commit future crimes, such as drug treatment programs and vocational training programs. These reforms produced results. Rhode Island has seen a 9 percent decline in the state's prison population, matched by a 7 percent decline in the state's crime rate since enacting our reforms in 2008. Other states, such as Texas, Kentucky, Ohio, and Arizona, had similar outcomes. This story is one of the most underreported successes of the past decade. 
The states are ahead when it comes to criminal justice reform, but some of us in Congress are trying to catch up. As you all know, the Senate Judiciary Committee recently passed the Smarter Sentencing Act, authored by Senator Lee and Senator Durbin. This bill reflects the common sense approach to sentencing reform that has worked so well in our states. It reduces some mandatory minimums, but only for nonviolent drug offenses. Drug offenders are 50% of our federal prison population, and there's no way we can bring prison spending under control unless we find a better way to focus our resources on those offenders who represent the most serious threat without wasting money locking up lower level offenders for years longer than is necessary. In addition, I've worked with Republican Senator Rob Portman of Ohio on legislation to reduce recidivism by requiring the Bureau of Prisons to expand programs that have been proven to cut the risk that inmates will reoffend when they are released. In exchange for taking real steps to reduce their recidivism risk, our bill offers inmates a modest sentence reduction. It's based on the simple recognition that nearly every inmate in federal prison, prison will be released at some point. And we are all better off if they get out a little earlier, but with a lower risk of committing more offenses. If they get out later, but immediately go back to committing crimes, nobody wins. For the past several weeks, I've been working closely with Senator John Cornyn, the Republican whip, on a bipartisan compromise in this area. Senator Cornyn and I are both former attorneys general, and we share a common recognition that out of control prison spending doesn't make us safer. It actually makes us less safe. Before I close, let me add one thought, and that is that we need to make sure we're paying attention not just to the inmates and their transition from custody back out into the community, but also to the communities that receive them. If you look at the map of Rhode Island and you focus on the zip codes and you plot into each zip code which ones are getting the bulk of the released inmates, you will see that there is a small number of zip codes that carry an enormous burden of having to deal with this population and help support their reintegration into society. We've gotten used to that being something that we ask of these communities, and frankly, that is wrong. If you tried to shift it to other communities, they would go berserk. And it is really important that we kind of recalibrate ourselves and make sure that the communities that are very heavy recipients of people coming out of prison get the support for those communities that they need as well as the support for those inmates that they need. The developments in Congress that I talked about are promising, but we shouldn't be naive about the path forward. For a lot of elected officials, it's always going to be easier to talk tough on crime, even if it means making us less safe in the long run in actuality. I am proud that 13 members of the Judiciary Committee voted for the smarter approach and supported the Durbin-Lee bill. Our recent progress is in part a testament to the hard work that all of you and so many others have put into this effort to lay the foundation for that legislative work. That work, however, is just beginning. We've been successful in large part because criminal justice has so far not become a partisan issue. Indeed, a lot of the old partisanship has come out of that issue. So even as we fight over Obamacare, unemployment insurance, and the IRS, we've been able to make real progress in this area because both parties have taken ownership of it. Whether we succeed in the end will largely depend on whether that continues to be true. But if states as diverse as Texas and Rhode Island and Kentucky and Ohio can find ways to control prison costs while better protecting their public, then surely we in Congress ought to be able to do the same. So I thank you all very much for your leadership on this issue. I look forward to continuing to work with you to make these results possible and to improve the public safety of our communities the smart way. Thank you.